10.1 starts using the antiderivative for something really important in graphical, which is the idea of the area under a curve. Um, and it's something that we're really going to focus on for really the remaining of the course. And that area under the curve is given really important. There's a little bit of notation before I get into that function that the curve itself um, is given to us as y equals, sorry, my smart board just kind of powered down on me here. Um, the function itself is given to us as y is equal, and I'll use that lowercase f of x. And that's a really important concept because it gives this notation a little more meaning. Remember, I'm going to write it here that capital F of x is the antiderivative, try to spell it right, antiderivative, okay, I ran out of room, derivative of lowercase f of x. And that's going to be really important because it gives us th that ability to actually identify what we're finding. Now, for this particular function, if we were di identifying this as the area as a function of b, that would be in here right in place. So that's the area. And I'll give it a little bit of cross hatching just for good measure. And then the upper limit, which we I've identified as x is equal to b, is there. The lower limit is x is equal to a. Now, what this is going to allow us to do is it's really going to allow us to find the area under any curve. What's really important and a little bit frustrating about this is that they, they don't have to give us y equals f of x as a differential equation. And that's going to be a really important concept that as we move in chapter 10, and we'll, we'll introduce some new notation, we'll talk about this as the integral a little bit later, um, the antiderivative is giving us the ability to find the area under any curve. So this is not solving a differential equation. Antiderivatives are certainly used for this. This is another application of antiderivatives. So if we want to find the area under y equals 2x plus 1, I'm just going to make a couple definitions here. I'm going to say that lowercase f of x, let me get rid of that blue line. It's going to drive me nuts. Um, I actually don't know. There we go. Um, so lowercase f of x, I'm going to define as 2x plus 1. That allows me to say that uppercase f of x is equal to, and we're just going to take the antiderivative here. So it's x squared plus, I'll write 1x, even though we don't need that 1, and then plus a constant. Important to still put that constant in there when you're doing the antiderivative. Now, to try to give this a little bit more meaning, that graph of 2x plus 1 intersects the y-axis at positive 1 and has a slope of positive 2. We are trying to find the area from 1 to 4. And we don't really need the points, but I think at least initially it's good to talk about them. This is going to be at 1 comma 3. And then over here, we're going to have this point at 4 comma 9. What we are finding is this region right here that I've kind of shaded in in blue. Now, I am going to call that region, you know, we can call that region capital R. I'm going to call it the area as a function of 4. It is still important. I really don't like this notation. We're going to introduce some more later on. Um, we still have to know the lower bound, right? So the area from 4 to 0 is different than the area from, you know, 4 to 1, which is part of the reason I don't like this notation. But I am going to write that that area in blue is going to be equal to the antiderivative evaluated at 4 minus the antiderivative evaluated at 1. That allows me to say that this area is going to be equal. I'll put those in brackets individually. So this is going to be 4 squared plus 4 plus that constant minus 1 squared plus 1 plus that same constant. And that's a really important consideration. We don't know what that constant is, but we don't need to because we are applying the same antiderivative, right? It's the same constant regardless of what it would be. So when I do this subtraction, I'll write the whole thing out. We're going to have that the area as or area at x equals to 4 is equal to 16 plus 4 plus the constant. Remember that this negative has to distribute onto that second bracket. So I'm going to subtract 1, subtract 1 again, and then subtract the constant. I cannot stress enough that those are the same constant. So they will cancel each other out. And all that's left here is to do 16 plus 4, which is 20, minus 1 is 19, minus 1 is 18. And I get that that region is equal to 18. Now, there is some good news here. Your calculator can do this. So this is something that is very, very checkable. The one thing that I forgot to do here, a little bit of an oversight, is because we are talking about area, it's not a bad idea to include unit squared there. Of course, if we did know the unit, and we'll talk about that later in the course, we could actually attach some you know, physical unit to that as well. So I'm just going to bring up my calculator, and we'll take a look at how to do this on the calculator. Okay, so the, the one frustrating thing about using your calculator for this is the symbol is going to look a little weird, at least initially, until we get a little bit further into chapter 10. Um, the first thing we do have to do is we have to graph the function we're looking to find the area underneath. 
Um, I'm going to start in Zoom Standard. We're going to leave it. Uh, I'll just I'll hit Zoom Standard. Let's look at the graph. We'll make sure I've done it right. Um, there's no real reason that we would need to know these values, but it's never a bad idea to make sure I'm doing things correctly. So I'm going to check that you know one comma three is there, and then oh it's not three is it? It's four. We see the four comma nine is up there. Now to get the calculator to find the area under the curve, what we have to do is go to second trace, which is our calculate menu. Um, down here, we've used this one before, this dy over dx. We know it's the derivative. And like so many times in math, we are actually using the antiderivative, which is the opposite. So it's the option underneath. Now, this little kind of squiggly elongated s is something called the integral. We are going to talk about that and we'll use the notation. We'll get into that in much more detail because that's typically how we present this in a calculus textbook. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to option number seven, hit enter, and then it tells me the lower limit. Well, this is the lower value of X, which was one. We can just type it in the upper limit. So that's the upper value of X was positive four. We can type it in again and it even does the shading for us. And it tells us that that area is equal to 18. Now, like most things on the calculator, there is a downside. If you do get some kind of a fractional area, the calculator is going to present that as a decimal. So we often ask you for exact values um, to make sure that you can do the algebra in these questions. All right, um, so the remaining part of this lesson is just doing a few more of these. Um, I'm going to try to keep kind of doing the exact same thing I've done in the previous questions. I'm going to identify in the context what we're using here. So for this question, f of x is the given curve, or I should say lowercase f of x. So that's going to be x squared plus 2. That means that the antiderivative of that function, and really just using our, you know, our anti-power rule, if we want to call it that, we are going to have one-third x cubed plus 2x plus some unknown constant. Now, I don't really like, they should have maybe written this a little bit better, but this is interval notation. So it's telling us to go from x equals two to x equals four, right? The lower bound and the upper bound is given there. All right, I really do like that idea of a sketch. I think it helps to, to identify that we're really doing a very graphical process here. The curve y equals x squared plus two is the parabola shifted two units up. So something like this, when x is equal to 2, that function is going to be 6. So I'll just put that this is 2 comma 6 there. And then when x is equal to 4, that function is going to be at 4 comma 18. Now, I am putting the y values there just to make sure we can attach this meaning with the function. There is no real necessity whatsoever to determine those y values. Right? They truly do not matter because it's only x that gives us the ability to find that area. And for this question, shading in black may be a bad choice, but that is the region that we're looking at. That's our area. Now, in order to find that area, again, I don't really like this notation, but I'm going to stick with it. I'm going to write that the area as a function of our antiderivative is going to be equal to the antiderivative evaluated at 4, the upper bound, minus the antiderivative evaluated at 2, which is our lower bound. So that area is going to be equal to, brackets are your friend when you're doing this, the antiderivative, not the function, right? So it's uppercase F, not lowercase F, is going to be one-third times four cubed plus two times four plus the unknown constant. Then I'm going to subtract one-third times two cubed plus two times two plus that same constant. Now, don't feel like you have to rewrite each and every step within here. What a lot of students will do, and this is good, this comes from practice, is recognize that these constants are going to cancel. And it's worth mentioning that with this technique, they will always cancel because we're using the same antiderivative, right? Capital F needs to have the same constant. And so they will always cancel in this context. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to write this out just a little more so we can see some of the algebra that's happening here. I'm going to say go back to black here that the area as a function of four okay four cubed is 64 so we have 64 over three plus eight minus two cubed is eight so we have eight thirds plus four all right i'm going to deal with the fractions first so that area is going to be so 64 over three minus eight over three is 56 thirds plus 12 and what i need to do now is look to simplify this as much as possible. And I've made a little mistake here. Thankfully, I caught it though. Um, this is what happens when you don't show your work. I forgot to distribute this negative into the bracket. So this needs to be negative four, which means that we're gonna be adding four at this point because eight minus four is positive four. Um, to add those fractions, they need the same denominator. Four is the same thing as 12 thirds. 56 thirds plus 12 thirds 
lets me know that the area at that four value is going to be equal to 68 thirds and I'm going to put units. Now I would like to mention that if you did this on the calculator, your calculator would tell you that this is at 22.666666 and usually at some point it gives up and puts a seven in place. Now we have talked about this, you know, throughout the course and throughout several courses that 68 thirds is exact and 22.6666 is going to be approximate. And I'm not saying that approximate doesn't have value. It does. Sometimes you, you just need a physical number, right? To the nearest thousandth. Use your calculator for that. Although you could certainly use this technique as well. All right, there's three examples left. And I think I'm just gonna push through and do this lesson in one part. So our next example is really the same thing, just introducing some of those different functions that we've done the antiderivative for. So it's telling us to find the area between y equals sine x and the x-axis. Now that's worth mentioning that, that early on, we talked about how this is the area under the curve. And that's typically how it's presented initially. Really what we're doing here is we're finding the area between the curve and the x-axis. And that, not in this question, but it is gonna be important as we go on that if the function is below the x-axis, this technique is gonna yield a negative area. And we've talked a lot in math that you cannot have negative area. And that's still true. You cannot have negative physical area, but you can have negative graphical area. And the reason for that is on a graph, the area is negative if it's below the x-axis and it's positive if it's above the x-axis. What this allows us to do is deal with something called net change um, where if we knew, just for an example, let's say the flow of water into or out of the pool, we could use this process to find out how much water total has been added or how much water total has been taken away, which is, you know, a little bit far afield of what we're doing here. So I'm just going to try to uh, reorient myself back to this question. So if the function in question is sine x, then the antiderivative of that function, now you have to be careful, right? We know that sine x and cos x kind of switch back and forth. If the derivative of cos is negative sine, then the antiderivative of positive sine is negative cos. Make sure you know how to or where to find that on your formula sheet. That is definitely something you could just check via the formula sheet. Now it wants us to find the area from pi over six to pi over two. So I'm not gonna worry about the entire sine function, but it does look something like this, where it would continue in both directions. I'm gonna identify pi over six, which is right here. I'm not worried about the y value. I'm just going to put pi over 6 there. Pi over 2 is actually at that local max. There's pi over 2. And then they want us to find this region. To find that region, and again, with that notation, I'm going to write that that's the area up to pi over 2. But we need to know from the question that we are going to take the antiderivative evaluated at pi over 2 and subtract our antiderivative evaluated the lower bound, which is pi over 6. Well, this is gonna be the negative cos of pi over two plus a constant minus the negative cos of pi over six plus the same constant. So similar to the last question, these constants will cancel. I'm not gonna mess it up now. I'm actually gonna rewrite it to make sure I don't. This is gonna be equal to negative cos pi over two plus the cos of pi over six. So that bracket in there. Um, a lot of unit circle creeping back in, right? I know it's probably been a while since you've done it, um, but the cos of pi over two, if we think about the unit circle at pi over two, that point is zero comma one. The cos of an angle corresponds with the X coordinate. So this is negative zero plus the cos of pi over six. The point at pi over six is root three over two comma one half. So the cos of that angle will be root three over two. Negative zero is just zero. So I get that this area from pi over, pi over six to pi over two is going to be root three over two. Again, that is exact. If you have your calculator, it would give you 0 0.866, which a bunch of stuff after. That is approximate. It is a very important conversation for you to understand, um, you know, what is required to get an exact form answer versus what required to get, you know, an, an approximate answer. Typically, approximate answers just need the calculator. All right, two more here. I know it's a bit long in one video, but pause, take a walk, do some push-ups, whatever you need to do, and then come back and we'll finish it. So we're finding the area bound by y equals 4 minus x squared and the x-axis. Another word for bound is contained. And the reason why we can get away with saying contained is that if I graph 4 minus x squared, it looks like this. Important to know where these points are. This is at 0, 4. 
this point, this x-intercept is at two comma zero, and this x-intercept is at negative two comma zero. And that is important because that means the area bound, I'm gonna draw my x-axis with a blue line here. The area bound between those two regions is what I'm shading in green. Well, in order to get that green area, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna say that that green area, and I'm gonna call it the area at two, is equal to the antiderivative of the upper bound, which is positive two, this point right here that I'm shading in black there, minus the antiderivative at negative two, which is this point right here, which I'm shading in black. Now we don't have to do it in this question, but because this parabola is symmetrical, we could find the area between two and zero and then just double it because that would be equal on either side. And if you remember back in curve sketching, that is part of the advantage of knowing whether or not a graph has even symmetry. Because this graph has even symmetry, it is a mirror image across that y-axis. And then there's some slight advantages to knowing that. Okay, uh, back to my technique I've been using. The function itself is four minus x squared. So its antiderivative is going to be four x minus one third x cubed plus a constant. Really, really important that you're comfortable with those antiderivatives. I'm sure you're starting to see just how much we use them at the back end of this course. So I'm going to say that this area bound by our function and the x-axis is going to be equal to 4 times 2 minus 1 third times 2 cubed plus a constant minus 4 times negative 2 minus 1 third times negative 2 cubed plus that same constant ran out of room there at the end there should be a constant there sorry about the writing but similar to our other examples that constant will cancel i'm actually going to write this one out a little more because students do occasionally um, get tripped up by the the multitude of negatives that are happening here so i'll just do the first bracket four times two is eight minus eight thirds but then i'm going to subtract and in my second bracket i have negative eight and then because i'm subtracting one third times negative two cubed i actually end up adding eight thirds there all right now the advantage to doing this and a lot of students start to see the number show up and think oh it's going to be zero but i hope graphically we understand it can't be zero i'm going to say that the area is equal to eight minus eight thirds i'm going to apply that negative and we end up adding eight and subtracting eight thirds so that area is equal to 16 minus 16 thirds i'm going to rewrite 16 as 48 thirds and if I have 48 thirds minus 16 thirds, that leaves me with 32 thirds. And again, I'm just going to put unit squared there. I think I might have forgot to do that on the last question. But um, really, really important that if you're just jamming into your calculator, it's going to give you 10.66. We want to make sure that you can get that exact value answer. And that's certainly going to be the focus. Okay, one more, um, and it's everybody's favorite, I'm sure which is Euler's number. Um, definitely a little bit harder to get the antiderivative, I think, in this question. Um, but make sure you, you go back, you take a look. We have that table in 9.1, um, and that allows you to, to quickly evaluate some of these. So again, I'm going to say that f of x is equal to 2e to the negative 2x. That means that the antiderivative is the original coefficient divided by the coefficient on the x. And then because it's an Euler function or an exponential function, um, the actual Euler piece doesn't change. And then I'm going to add C here. Now, the more you clean this up, the better off you'll be. And so I'm going to say that my antiderivative is negative E to the negative 2X plus C. All right. Now, I, you know, I, I could draw the curve, but I think it's important to start to work towards the fact that you don't actually need the graph for this. I'm going to say that that area between this curve and the x-axis from 0 to 1 is going to be equal to my antiderivative evaluate at 1 minus my antiderivative evaluate at 0. So that's going to be equal to negative e to the power of negative 2 times 1 plus a constant minus negative e to the power of negative 2 times 0 plus the same constant. We're going to do lots of kind of simplification here because, you know, dealing with exponents is a little bit trickier. Those constants will cancel. And then what I have is this is going to be negative e to the negative 2 plus e to the power of 0. This is negative 1 over e squared plus 1. And if we can do one more thing here. We want to get a single fraction. The simpler the answer, the better. So I'm going to multiply this 1 by e squared over e squared. 
and I get that this is equal to negative one over e squared plus e squared over e squared. And then the final answer, I'll write e squared minus one over the common denominator e squared. All right, lots of little kind of exponential work when we do some of those Euler functions. Um, just takes practice to get used to it, to get comfortable with it. Um, this area under a curve, we're gonna use again in 10.2. It's a very important concept in this kind of back end of the calculus course. All right, there is the assignment up for you to do. Um, as always, email me if you have any problems. We can do a Zoom meeting or, or whatever we need to to get you as comfortable as possible with this material.